We're up to our full interview with Kurt Newman of the Bodine. Started the band with Sam Giannis in 1983. We know them from, of course, Closer to Free, the theme song to Party of Five. They had a lot of FM airplay. They just released an album a few months ago called For the Last Time. We'll be talking about different tracks off the album, and there'll be links to where you can pick it up in the description. Remember, if you want to support the channel, the two Ps, join our Patreon. There are links in the description, or you can make a PayPal donation. Links are there as well. Here's Kurt Newman of the Bodines. When did you... And I find artists sometimes have a hard time doing that the right way. Tell me about, you just getting up in a zone when you're right. Like, tell me about that. Um, well, for me as a kid, like and teenager and stuff growing up, uh, music was a place I would escape to from the real world kind of. And it was so intense that when a music, when a song would fade out, I always felt like it was going away from me and I couldn't go with it. And I wanted to go with it. Like I was really drawn into the music in a very personal way. And I think it was the atmosphere of those songs that drew me in like that. So I probably picked that up from the music I was listening to. And, and it's important to me to that there, a real mood is happening, that there's some kind of, atmosphere that you feel is going on while the while the song is playing while i'm singing to you or whatever is happening that uh there's that general feeling of something you can almost fall into and i i feel like that's might be where i picked up for and that's why i i got good at it because i just experimented till i was able to do it myself you know in radio we have this thing where we used to say uh, in a generic thing in radio is a lot of people radio announcers can't talk about themselves they, they, they think they're really good and they've got everything down. But when it comes to talking about themselves, their insecurities come out. Mm -hmm. And there's that thing that you have the, uh, the capacity, like, like anyone but you, for instance. To me, that has such a, like, I'm going, oh, this is like haunting. Yeah. Let's start there. T tell me about that tune. Yeah, I felt the same way. I just wanted, I just wanted a musical piece that had wide open space in it. You know, and you go from this wide open space to this just bombard of big chorus that just hits you like a wave would hit you in the ocean kind of. But I love the open space about it. And I love just the simplicity of the beat and the starkness of that melody. It just, to me, it just drew me in to that place of isolation and the perspective of that song, you know, um, you're, you're, you're part of this society, but sometimes we're so in our own point of view on it, you know, that you wonder what other people are thinking and stuff. And, and, and that's kind of what I felt when I was writing that song. It's, it's very much from one person's point of view of seeing the world. And yeah, it's about kind of retrospect, looking back, missing someone and things like that. But it's more to me, it was more about that feeling of isolation Um as well, you know, the music of that piece to me is, is I like just as much as what I'm singing about. And so um, I, that's one of my favorite tracks on the record too. I, I just love it. With this album, what, what was the trajectory? Like, what was the impetus? How long did it take for you to, to get this together? Well, I've been writing songs for a Netflix show called The Ranch for, they had eight seasons and the producers were big fans of the band. So they let me write a ton of music of which they put a bunch of it into their show. And uh, so I was just constantly writing and recording, writing and recording like a lot in the 2016 through 2018 kind of phase. And um, I built up a lot of these songs and through the last several records, I've been able to get a lot of them out. So some of these songs are a couple of years old. One of them loved is, is about 15 to 20 years old. It, gorgeous like, song, by the way, gorgeous like, piece of music. Very, very little. And um it, when they were little, it, it, it made me realize a lot about my own childhood. And so I wrote that song and um, it was never quite right to release. So anyways, I kind of went at it again for this record. So some of the songs are pretty old. Some of them are relatively new, but um, I've been trying to get them out for a couple of years now. It's just the pandemic put it all off for a while. So now I was able to finally get them out. I'm not going to leave you stumbling in the dark. I love that. I like that. You know, the most simplistic yeah. lines sometimes are the most poignant lines. Yeah. That, 
Well, w- which was my case. My, my mom put me in school when I was four years old. I didn't know how to read or write or anything. And so I, from that point on through my entire life, I was kind of trying to like figure out workarounds and how to get through this system and stuff like that. And I just wanted my kids to not have to deal with that, you know, that knew that they had a support system there for them. But so that's where that idea came from. How uh, there's about a few artists that I talk to now and then, and I'll say, how many times have they screwed up your name? Uh, Kasim Sultan is one guy. He says, oh my God, I'm surprised when people, uh, 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 Ifa O'Donnell is another one, you know, where no one gets her name right. She's the story of my life. Uh, you have the name of a famous microphone that radio stations use, which pronounced Neumann, of course. Yeah. Uh, how Do people usually get your name good? Yeah, but, you know, the funny thing is, is my great ancestors are from that area of Germany where the microphone company started. So um, I am probably related to that company in, in a different way. My, my heritage is from Bonn, Germany, and my understanding is like some of the microphone uh, people came from that area as well. So I always felt kind of a connection to rock and roll music from the first time I ever saw one of those microphones. Uh, Pièce de Résistance on the album, You've Gotta Go Crazy. I love the energy. I love the way, you know, my first program director who actually gave me that beautiful Studer reel-to-reel back there for $1,000, it's worth 10 times that. Um, He um, used to tell me, how does a song make you feel? And that song makes me feel happy to be on this planet. Tell me about that too. Yeah, that's what I wanted. You know, in Wisconsin, we had pretty intense winters growing up. And when spring would come around and we'd have our first 50 degree days, you'd roll down the windows and you'd turn the radio up and everything just felt good because you were going into summertime and coming out of the pandemic and stuff. That's how I felt. I wanted a song on the record. I could just go out and play that would make everybody feel like I want to turn this song up on the radio. You know, I just want to crank it. It's not about a deep message, but it is about just having fun and letting go. And like some days you'd just skip school and you you weren't doing the right thing. You were just going a little crazy and having fun. And so that was the message I wanted to release in that song was just go out. Sometimes you got to do that when times are tough or you're having a difficult day. Sometimes just skip out and go do something fun instead. Uh, the first title of that, uh, I usually go through the titles when I go in and Pressure Queen was the was the, the first one where I went, oh, there's, and I listened to it, nice, lazy, kind of sultry opening. Tell me about that one. Well, that's more or less about my wife. <laughs> she, uh, she fights the good fight all the time, you know, and um, I just feel sorry for her a lot that she gets so stressed out. And, uh, you know, some people do that. They just have to fight the good fight. And so I wanted to write about that. Um, that feeling that I get from watching her fight those fights in the distance all the time and trying to pick her up when she's falling down. And um, that was the feeling behind that one. Uh, I'm a mess. Is that, is that the one about Tom Petty? No, that's a little more time. Okay. Um, I'm a mess was about kind of touring and being out there for too long on the road, on the buses. And you just, uh, you're in a different kind of world. It almost feels like the circus that, that you're in because you're living these different hours, this different life, different town every day, and you just start to miss that family back there, back home. And so you realize that you're just kind of a mess without that grounding experience of being with the people you love. Whereas a little more time is, you know, I grew up listening to Tom Petty Records and he was a, such a big influence on my, my life that I wanted to kind of give back when I started writing a little more time, I just felt I started singing it like Tom Petty, you know, mocking his voice because it reminded me so much of his type of song that he might write in the late seventies or something like that. And so I wanted to dedicate it to him and the heartbreakers because they just, they gave me so much pleasure with the music that they wrote. And when he died, it really affected me because uh, there was just so much good music there. And I, I don't know, I couldn't name another artist that gave me that much great music that, that he did um, with his songwriting and with his great band, of course, but just that songwriting that was just so incredible. How does, how does a guy, and what's the motivation, the impetus for a guy to become a multi-instrumentalist? I mean, uh, I, I read about the fact that I didn't realize in the beginning, pardon my ignorance, that you, know, you were a drummer, um, which my son is a much better one than me. Uh, but... Uh, there's a different, you know, all the drumming jokes, right? But there's a different, I mean, I, I realized at one point, you might, you might know this or not, drummers, 
more often than not become catchers in baseball, become goalies in hockey. It's quite common. I'd ask around going, what? Because it's the <laughs> important guy in the background, but he's the important guy. He's really, uh, what's the first instrument you, you started playing? Was it drums? drums? Yeah. I love the drums. The, the difference of drums is they're so physical. They're, they're very physical and you get a lot out physically when you're playing drums. And I love that about the drums. And I felt very good being just a drummer. But when I got out of high school, I thought um, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have money to go to college or anything. So I, I bought an electric guitar just so I could start learning to write songs for myself, original songs instead of, so I didn't have to play other people's. And uh, I just stumbled into playing guitar live because I, I wanted to have a party and we didn't, I didn't know people, but I thought I could play enough on guitar to get through these songs. So I taught my brother how to play drums and just for this party. And then that's where Bodine's kind of started. And, and, you know, a couple of years later, I was in Hollywood working with T-Bone Burnett, playing guitar and singing songs, but I had never planned on doing that. You know, I, I thought I was going to be the drummer. It just where life took me. And I, I just kind of went with it and learned as I went, as far as, playing multiple instruments, you know, I, like I said earlier, I escaped into music as a kid and I was a kid. I would always go to the band room and just hang there. And there was all those musical instruments there. So you could experiment and learn. And throughout my time in school, I learned that you could get out of certain classes like math and science or English classes if you were taking these other music classes. So I just kept taking all the music classes I could. And and you spend enough time in there, you just learn how to play other things. You're also a good example, though, if I may be so bold of, you sort of got the signals. Some people, you know, they go the, I remember when The Secret came out, I was a, I was starting to be a less new age guy at that point. But, you know, of going, you know, follow, you know, get the cues and try to make the right decisions. You've made a lot of good decisions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. I appreciate that. I, I'm just winging it. You know, I, I go with intuition on what feels like the right thing to do. And like, you know, of course, when we were signed with Warner Brothers, you get a lot of pressure from the record label wanting to get you on radio and they, they want to make money off your music. So you you have to navigate that. But at the same time, you still have to use your intuition on on working in the industry and doing your music and being true to yourself. And you try to find a place where it works where it's not just uh, mediocrity, you know, it's still interesting. And yet the business of music can be happy and you can be happy and you can survive now more in life. I'm able to just um, do what I want to do. So I'm trying to do more of that. These songs were written for a certain way for this, for Netflix show Americana type sound but I would like to experiment a little more in different sounds too and do different records yet. Well, with Closer to Free, and, and of course, that became a theme of a big show, uh, Party of Five. And 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 uh, so, and, and again, pardon my ignorance. I know about the ranch and I'm familiar with it. Uh, have you done any other TV things? Well, our songs have been in a lot of music, uh, a lot of movies, you know, going way back to The Color of Money with Tom Cruise and, and Paul Newman, um, Still the Night was a big song in there. And, you know, we've had songs in movies like that um, throughout our career, but never to the point of that it was a theme song or um, to where a series said, look, I want you to write as much music as possible for this and we'll keep going. That was certainly a new experience for me to be able to do that. Well, by the way, how do you get a gig like like The Ranch? How, how does that present? I mean, do you go after it? Does it present itself a little bit of both? Well, how did that happen? That one presented itself. I was just one of the guys that plays in my band was on an airplane and he was talking about the Bodines to someone who knew the producers of the ranch. And they were like, oh, here, you should call this guy. He loves your music. And so I call him and he's like, oh, please do as much music as possible. So it just kind of I was lucky it came to me. And um, typically it's best when it works that way. It's hard to go out and get things that you really want. Um, very often you feel like I could do a great job with that, but you just can't convince somebody <laughs> to give it to you. So it's hard for closer to free. Cause if I, uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I was told years ago, never asked that, but 
I'll leave it up to you to what you want to share uh, with me about that tune. Um, Close to Free was interesting because uh, it was on a record three years before it ever became a hit. So it had been released as a second or third uh, single off the record and really didn't do much on its own. It wasn't until the TV show uh, Party of Five discovered it and tried it. They were trying several songs out for a theme song and that one just worked best for them. And so we had been playing that song for a lot of years. You know, it was always a fun song to play, but when it all of a sudden years later took off on its own journey to be a hit, uh, we were already used to, you know, having a good time with the song and playing it and, and making the most out of it. So it was just a natural thing. Again, it just happened on its own. And it's, it's great in life when you're lucky enough to have stuff kind of come along and just do something like that. Cause it introduced us to, I think a lot of people around the world that would have never heard us. Uh, so that O'Brien, I mean, my God, well, I know Kenny plays with you guys. Is he still with you? Kenny Arnoff? He's not at the moment this summer because he's doing all kinds of like TV shows and other things like that. But um, he, he comes in and out of our, for like 27 years now, he's been in and out yeah. playing with us. So a lot of times he'll jump on, play some shows with us. And other times he goes off and has to do his own thing. Did you start doing that because of COVID or anything? like? What was the catalyst? For, and I'd love for you to do more of that because I love that kind of stuff. I like yeah. musicians talking to musicians or, and or interesting people, you know? Yeah, my daughter asked me to do that because she was working in podcasts and I, I didn't never think of doing a podcast. But um, going through school, I was not a kid who functioned in that system. And it I didn't understand why we didn't have a system that dealt with um, kids' minds who work different, you know, and so I always wanted to talk about that, whether it was teach a course or whatever. And the podcast gives me a platform to talk about creativity in the world and just how important I think it is and how little we actually put any emphasis on it. it it's mind blowing to me, my kids in school or when I was in school nobody's mentioning creativity. I don't hear, I never heard it mentioned all. They were like, shut your mouth. We don't want to hear your opinion, read this book and learn this. And, and it's not a good system. It doesn't work. And if every day a kid was walking into school and a teacher was saying like, what did you do creatively today? Or what are you going to do creatively? It didn't matter if they loved math or science or anything it would still be a fuel for propelling all of that forward. And so the podcast is me pushing that message. Creativity is the fuel for everything in this world. And uh, we need to emphasize that more. So I'm going to talk to people who have interesting creative stories, and I'm going to try and get that story out of them. Is there anybody out there that you'd like to get, because I'd like to send this out into the ether, that, that you would like to talk to on, on the show? Um, well. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix, people like that would be nice to get on because I think that would be an exclusive. But <laughs> but short of that, um, there's not one person. I just really want to find um, interesting stories out there. Um, sometimes my daughter will be like, oh, you need to interview this person. I'll be like, who's that? I don't even know. I'll be like, why would I talk to them? But then when I read about them, typically there's something they did that was interesting. And um, I find it fascinating, you know or they use their intuition in some way that I think listening to your intuition is super important part of being creative. And so Zappy was good, by the way. Yeah. Again, like, you know, it may not be for everyone to go and travel somewhere and take ayahuasca, but um, for some people it might work and it might be, you know, it's not something you hear every day. Right. But there's, not, I don't think there's anybody, let me interrupt you. I'm sorry. I don't think there's any, Ayahuasca, and I've, and I've read a lot about it. I don't think there's anybody who wouldn't be interested in this, in the experiences or curious about it, though. That's the thing about that. It's well, fascinating. What was most interesting to me was what we stumbled on to when I talked to him about, well, how are you ever going to get this to be a mass marketed? Because insurance companies will just snuff it out. And he said, oh, actually, it's the opposite insurance companies find it's cheaper. So they're going to want to use this. And I was just like, it was mind blowing to me that an insurance company would shut down pharmaceuticals in order to have, you know, psychedelics be, or microdosing of psychedelics work, what works better and is cheaper. They'll push that. And I thought like, wow, now that's creativity. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Like 
we're able to do something that might be better for you, might be better for everyone rather than the side effects that they get from pharmaceuticals. And the insurance industry might actually help move it along. Like, when do you hear about that? Usually it's the opposite story that we hear. So I thought, you know, that's, that's the beauty of the interviews is you stumble across something that's really interesting. And, and it's potential with, I just saw a special on, on one of our streaming services. It's potential for people who are dealing with, uh, with uh, addiction. You know. Depression and alcohol. Yeah, I grew up with an alcoholic father. So it was really touched uh, home for me that somebody might be able to beat this disease in that way. Uh, Sam Giannis, uh, uh, how has that been left? Like that, that you guys obviously do not talk at all anymore. No, no. My, um, after Sam had quit the band, my daughter was able to speak about the molestation that was going on. And, uh, and she was brave enough to talk about it and get it out in some interviews. And um, it was good for her in order to, for her to move on in her life, to be able to speak about it. It was devastating to me and my family. You know, it's still something that hurts terribly when there's someone who you trusted so much, you know, like a brother that would cross a line like that. Um, it was really dark. And it was really hard to get past, but, you know, uh, I try not to focus on that. I tried to uh, focus on the music and the positivity and where we are now playing shows and the people who come out and sing with us, because uh, that's kind of a testament to the, the good part of what I do. And um, I let the past kind of fall away now. I appreciate you sharing that, though. Thank you. What was it like working with uh, Robbie Robertson? It was fantastic. Like everything you would imagine it would be. He was, uh, he was just so open, you know, when we walked in to work, you know, it's Robbie and Daniel and and all these people in the room and he plays this song. He's like, I want you to sing something on it. And right away I had an idea and they set up a microphone in the control room that I could sing. And so I started singing this part and Robbie throws his hands up like this in the back of the control room. And I just stopped singing. I was just like, Oh no. And he's like, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's it. And he loved it. And so we always had that kind of relationship um, throughout the process that he was wide open to stuff. And he was such a great human being. He had a million stories to tell. I, I loved being around him. Okay. One more thing. Oh, fade away. Love that tune. Three million streams on. Uh, uh, uh. Tell me, tell me about that song. Fade Away was uh, the first single, really. It was our introduction to the Bodines. I mean, to the world, and MTV played it. A uh, pretty heavy video of that one, and so um, it was everyone's first kind of introduction to Bodines, and and we still we still play it today. It's still one of my favorite songs to play because it was the start of everybody hearing us and getting to know us. And it was interesting song for the times. And so I, it was one of my earliest attempts at writing a song too. So, you, you know, bare naked ladies, you know, names of bands at the beginning, people say, Oh my God, it's sacrilege. You can't, you can't say that. And now people hear bare naked ladies and they think of bare naked lady. They think of the band. They don't think of bare naked ladies ever. Um, right. What was the thought process of going with Jethro? Well, first time I thought of Bodine's, I thought of Bo Diddley and James Dean. So it was a combination of two names that I thought represented rock and roll and that rock and roll image. So it made sense to me. I didn't, I didn't think of Jethro Bodine off the start because I didn't really know that show as well. But um, my Bo Diddley and James Dean, I did know. And I thought, well, that's a cool rock and roll image. So it made sense. I hope you enjoyed that. If you're listening to it via podcast, there's a video version. And the other way around, all the links are in the description. For the last time is the brand new Bodine's album. There are links in the description as well. And if you want to support the channel, the two Ps, we always say this. You can join our Patreon to get early access to all our videos. Or you can make a donation via PayPal. The links are all in the description. And like our videos, by the way. We appreciate that. Subscribe to our channel. Share the videos on social media. And of course, always comment on them. We love reading the comments. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book.